Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. How you doing? It's Pastor Eric. It's been a while since uh, I've recorded, and uh, I apologize sincerely, but I've been going through a lot of tribulation and afflictions. Uh, it's nothing can prepare you for when the devil robs you of your voice. And I thought it was important that you see me as well as hear me, so this will be uploaded on YouTube, uh, space, you know, willing that we can, I can be able to do that. But uh, I just want to thank you for all those who have prayed for me, uh, that have still kept listening to the broadcast that has been on uh, iHeart Radio and Spreaker, as well as visiting uh, my Facebook uh, personal account. And just just keep me in your prayers, those that have continued to uh, listen and know that the Word of God is being spoken and know that none of this is is from ambitious gain or any type of gain that just other than just wanting to see the saints uplifted, wanting to know that I can give back to the my Christian brothers and sisters, you who are listening, you who are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, you who though uh, may, may have stumbled in your in your walks but continue to keep striving for him. That's what it's all about. It's not about how well you keep church or how well you, you keep your devotions and not how well you look the part. It's about what's in here. It's about when you serve God here and here and with everything that you have, even when you're falling apart, even when you're, you're questioning and, and not sure where to step. That purity that you search for God with is what keeps you focused. And he that is in you is what keeps you focused. Jesus Christ, his mindset, the Holy Spirit, how he guides you and continues to go back. You know, I talk about when the devil robs you of your voice. And a lot of that has to do with when we fall to sin or we fall to doubt. Or we, 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 we stumble through a blessing that God gives us. You know, we are not taught and trained enough in our churches and by our leaders and even within looking in the Bible community online or whatnot, we're just not skilled at what happens when we falter in a blessing. It's just not talked about. It's not expounded upon. It's not preached on. And it's not even sought after. I mean, wh where on the Internet, where in the churches, where do you go when you falter in God's blessing. Is there anybody talking about it? Truth is, probably so, but so few and far between that we can't find them. But I'd like for you to know that there is precedence on this kind of process. This happens daily for many Christians. How do we falter in a blessing? When we fall to the big three, everybody is not going to be able to avoid this pitfall. The pitfall I've fallen in and many have fallen in, and you will fall into it. Whether it is your season of testing through your faith or whether it's because of our inability to, to manage and handle the blessing that's been given to us by using the strength of Jesus Christ to handle the blessing. You see, if you rely on your own strength and ability to handle the blessing, you will falter. It is inevitable. We are human. We are still sinners in the flesh. Though we are saved, promised, and sealed by the Holy Spirit, we still will fall to sin. It's going to happen. I hate the fact that so many brothers and sisters are sold a bill of goods that just doesn't measure up. You hear stuff like, you have victory in Christ. True. You're better than that. 
You can overcome sin. Everybody can do it. It's easy. I've been, and you hear people say, I've been doing it for a while. I just know what to do. But you don't hear the honesty coming from those people. You don't hear the truth coming from them. You hear the Christian speak. You know, the speak words say, well, you hear, you know, man, I'm going through some struggle. Well, you should know better. God loves you. My God, that doesn't address anything, does it? It doesn't make you feel it. It makes you feel dumb and stupid. Like, man, I guess I'm, my faith isn't good enough. I guess that I'm, I'm questioning these things. I guess I'm, something's wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. Even John the Baptist questioned, are you the Christ? And did Jesus respond back to him in, in, in the way that Christians respond today? You know, did he say, well, you know, you should know better. You should know better that uh, I am who I say I am, and, you know, you should know better in this kind of process. And I, Let's look up that Bible verse. Let's take a look at that, because when you see it, you don't, it, don't, it ain't talked about. Let's go to Luke 7.20. If you got your Bibles today, I hope you do. Luke 7.20. We're going to read, this is John the Baptist, and we don't want to look at Jesus' response, how Christians should respond when someone is struggling in, in their faith and, and, and getting beat down. Let's take a look at it. Now, Luke chapter 7, verse 18, ready to read. Then John's disciples told him about all these things, so John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord asking, here it is, look at this. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? Now, look at that. Now, you don't think that that, that, that that's John the Baptist. He's the one that laid Christ's head under that water, baptized him. He did say, see here, the Lamb of God is coming. Witnessed all that Jesus happened on that day of that baptism. Recognized Jesus Christ when he was in the womb inside of his mother. When Mary, when Mary came, John leaped in Elizabeth's stomach. So you would think of all the people questioning Jesus Christ, not John the Baptist, everybody's going to have a moment of weakness. Quit listening to these folks to sit there and tell you this other crazy Christian talk where they don't address your needs, they just want to make you feel like what you're feeling is dumb and crazy. You're not crazy. It's not your faith that's lacking. It's that you need to be fed. There's nothing wrong with let the Holy Spirit comfort you. But we're so used to hearing it from other people that we rob ourselves of Christ's ability to do that for us in our personal life. And then there's not enough Christians who know how to minister to help us in these situations. There's just not. Not that their heart is in the right place. Just ill-equipped. Not understanding what it takes to go through it. They've not been taught what it's like to fight when you're in the trenches, when you're covered in mud and muck and everything that you've done, when you're covered in your own faults and your sins, they're not skilled in how to meditate over you, how to pray over you, how to know where to go inside their spirit to come help you and to feed you. They just don't know. Sure, they can pick a Bible up and read it. Anybody can do that. But when it ain't coming from in here, and it ain't coming from here, and it's not coming from up there, it's going to not end where it needs to inside you. Don't blame them. You've got to look at the truth. Many are unskilled in knowing how to help each other. That's why we go to our Word of God every day. That's why we go into prayer. That's why we ask others for help when we're, we're struggling. You, you have strong prayer warriors. You have strong people that God has surrounded you with. You know, when, when Paul was struggling and Christ told him, you know, hey, I got people in this city. Don't worry about it. You're going to be okay. I promise you, you have people around you right now. You may not be close to them. You may not be on good speaking terms with them. Like, you, you know, like you're not the enemies with them, but you don't talk to them enough. You don't feel like you have the relationship with them that you can just pick up a phone or go see them. But I promise you, 
God has planted them people in your life, and you've got to recognize them. You'll know them because they are in a similar situation with you, and they're with you in spirit. They may not know what you're going through, but you just have a conversation with these people. You're going to hear them going, yeah, I'm going through something similar. And you'll be like, oh, my God, we're together in this. And that's what it's all about. When Christians were huddled together, when the Romans were killing us, were killing us, we were in the Roman Colosseums, surrounded and huddled together with lions and anything else trying to harm us and destroy us, trying to get us to turn away from our God. That still happened today. But instead of the Roman Colosseum and threats of lying, it's now threats of ostracism, losing friendships, uh, losing your job, uh, losing family, um, being labeled a hater and a bigot because you believe in, 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 in doing what's right in, in the Word of God and following His commandments of, and, 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 and adhering to the best thing you can in your life, to the, to the discipline that it takes to be a Christian. You know, when, when people look at you because they want to say, hey, what do you think about this situation of abortion? But, oh, you're a Christian. I already know what you're going to. You know, when you hear all that, just trying to push you to the background. This whole world is built on tolerance and, and understanding of sin. But they don't want to address it. They don't even want to look. They want to look at sin as either a civil rights issue or an issue that is just misunderstanding. It's not that sin is bad. It's just you have to understand that we're human, and we can overcome it just by our mental faculties and, and, and some good medication and other, you know, other self-help, self-made things they want to do. None of that addresses the truth about Christian suffering. None of it addresses the truth about sin and how it ravages families and destroying homes and destroying marriages and destroying children before they even get a chance in the world to have a, a, a real fighting chance to live a life that, 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 is, that, that God can look on and say, that is my child. It is so difficult. Ooh, Christians make it so hard to come home into the Christian faith. They make it so hard because they want to make it look like you almost have to sound like these, 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 these self-help gurus. For you to come in the church, you got to look a certain way and you got to put your suit on and you got to, you got to have your Sunday best. Your Sunday best may be the worst thing that you have with you. What do I mean by that? What if the best thing you can bring to the church is you, but when you get in there, nobody wants to respect the fact that you came. You came as you are. You came as a broken sinner. You ain't wearing the right clothes. You needed to get a ride to get here. You, you had to feel bad about that. You had to call somebody for some help. and they, Man, you should have that already. You know, just things like that. Your wardrobe ain't right. Mine ain't right. You don't smell good. All that stuff that don't matter. You should be crawling into the hospital to try to get some help. You should not feel guilty for going into a hospital to get some help. You shouldn't feel guilty for asking another Christian, man, I'm having some doubts. I don't know what to do. You shouldn't feel guilty for asking for help. You just shouldn't. But when you're ill-equipped, not you, the other person on the other end, which may be you in certain cases, when you're not equipped to know how to handle someone hurting, what do you do? What do you do? You've got to trust in the Holy Spirit. You've got to know how to love your brothers and sisters. You've got to know how to quit trying to put some ointment on something before you realize what it is you're putting ointment on. It's real easy when someone says, man, I am, I am really faltering. Well, just have faith. You don't, even, you don't even ask them why they're faltering. What happened? And that's what we're going to discuss today. I'm not going to get too far off, but that's what we're going to discuss today. What happens when, you know, it's easy when we're being afflicted by something from the outside. It's easy to, to deal with when the devil's attacking. When I, I'm not saying it's easy, but you understand know it. When you can pinpoint the devil is on attack mode, a little bit you can handle the, the pressure a little bit different. You now know it's an external force that is fighting hard against you. you, you Christians can rally around somebody getting attacked by the devil because that's what we're taught to do. And that's fine and that's well and good. But what about when it's happening on the inside? 
What about when that stuff is happening inside the human being? When the flesh has caused the faltering to happen? What do you do then? What Now all of a sudden it changes the whole entire conversation to where before it was the devil and we can handle the devil. We can, we can pray him up. We can get that man up. But when you're dealing with personal affliction, when you have done something wrong, when you have faltered in a blessing, the conversation has to go a little different. It has to look at a little different. You're going to have to actually get knee deep into that person and figure out, okay, what's going on with them? And you're just going to need your testimony, and it's going to need your capacity to love and identify and understand and have compassion and have true desire to want to help that man or that woman in that problem. You know, it's real easy when when you just want to say, well, you know, I understand you need some help with your bills. I know you need help with food. I'm just going to pray for you and move on. Never realizing that God has blessed you to help them in your life. You know, it's one thing to then tell somebody, well, I just want to, uh, you know, I just want to uh, just get a little bit of help. I just need a little bit of help with, 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 with my telephone bill. I need a little help putting some food in, in my stomach. I ain't ate in a while. I just need a ride to the doctor. You know, I just need a little help. And you sit there and tell that man, well, hold on now. I know you need that help, but uh, I'm going to pray for you, bro, because, you know, I, I got struggles too. Never realize that what little that you have may go a long way to somebody else, but you're so busy worrying about yourself, which is just ridiculous. Now, now let, me, let me be honest. Is it bad to worry about you? No. But you're not in this by yourself. Let's take a look at what God said about dealing with other people when you're dealing with things yourself. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let's read this all the way through. Start at verse 1. If there's any encouragement in Christ, look at that, powerful. If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal, do nothing out of robbery or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Verse 5, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Paul. Paul summed it up, didn't he? Make your attitude, let's check that, let's, let's have put a whole line right through that. Make your own attitude, that of Christ Jesus. How do, you, how do you get around it? You can't get around that. That's about as powerful as you can get. Powerful. Make your attitude like Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we need to to look after others other than just kind of looking after our own stuff? Yes. Does that mean we need to be more cognizant and more understanding about what's happening outside and going on around us with all our friends and family? Yes. Does that mean that we need to be more, more giving of our time and, 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 our, and, our, and our resources and our food and our clothing to help others who are, who are, who are desperate and destitute and in bad spots? Yes, that does. That means what little you have that you bless somebody else with, don't you realize God's going to bless you too? Don't you think that's how you help your family and your friends and you help those who love you? You know, James said that when you just pray for someone and you don't do nothing about it, it does no work. It doesn't do anything. Faith without works is dead. Let's take a look at James chapter, James chapter 2. Watch this. Look at verse 5. Listen, my brothers, my dear brothers. Didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he had promised 
to those who love him? Yet you dishonored him, you dishonored that poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they blaspheme the noble name? Woo! It's getting rough. It's getting rough. You, but you see what we're talking about, right? You, you see this. This can't be there's anything that's not that, that that's too shocking to the, to our ears when we hear it. Right? Can't be too shocking. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you at your baptism? Do we do that as Christians? Do we just sit there and just honor the name of Jesus Christ, but we don't do none of his works? Watch this. Indeed, if you keep the royal prescribed, the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the entire law yet fails in one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to one who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Have you shown mercy to your brothers and sisters? That's pretty, that's pretty key in these situations. When you're dealing with, with false blessings and, and, and that's, they're asking you for help, well, this is the training seminar for that. Are you showing mercy? Is that a gift that you have? If it's not a gift of mercy, one of the holy spiritual gifts, isn't it something God's going to work in your character? Yes, the answer is yes. Let's go to verse 14. Now we're going to get to some more meat. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith Saving. If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give him what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if it doesn't have words, it's dead by itself. Once again, James bringing it home, telling us what is necessary. It isn't enough, brothers and sisters, if you sit there somebody says, man, I need some help. And you sit there and tell them, I'll pray for you, bro. But you have the means to handle that situation or give a slight remedy to it. Maybe you don't have enough to give them, but you have enough to get them by to the next level. Don't you think God is moving you in their life to help them along? Well, Pastor, I'm, I'm sorry, man, but you know I got my own problems, and I know they're going to squander this blessing. It's not for you to deal with that. It is for you to give the blessing out, not to be the judge and jury on what they're going to do with it. They have to have the responsibility, and the Holy Spirit and God will deal with them if they squander what has been blessed with. But it's not your job, it's not my job to try to be the judge and jury over that situation. I'm not giving to him because if I give to him, he's just going to squander it. She's just going to blow it out. Not my call. When they start doing that, you start putting yourself in the judgment seat, and that is not where we're supposed to sit. That is on God, and that is up to God, and that is God's purview, that is God's right, and God will handle that situation as he deems appropriate. Not you, not me. Our job is to do the blessing. Our job is to follow through what we're supposed to do. If it's not clear when someone comes to you and need for help, if the Holy Spirit is not tugging on you to say, you, you need to help this man, if you feel no mercy toward helping someone that you love, that you, are, that, you, that you have received in your life, if you don't feel any of that to help, something is broken. You are hardened by sin. Yes, you're hardened by sin. I pray to God and God said don't help you. God said don't help another Christian that's, 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 in, that's in dire need. Have you seen that happen in the Bible? The answer is, eh, eh, doesn't happen. No, doesn't happen. Because God is not going to leave his children stranded, hungry, broke, and worse of all, not trusting God. Can you imagine what it's like when somebody tells you some crazy nonsense like that? I want to help you, but God said don't do it. 
Does that sound like a God that says, if you need something, if you need a fish, I'm going to give you some stones? No, it doesn't. That sounds like a self-interested person, a person who n did not pray. That's someone who did not seek God for mercy to help you. That is someone who had a self-interest that looked upon their own needs and made a selfish decision and then tried to smear God's name in it by their bad choice. That's exactly what happened. Plain and simple. If you've done it, you are guilty of it. Repent and get past that. You're not placed in someone's life to be a judge over them, to confer their condemn them on a road they already have fallen into. Not your job to put your boot on them when they're trying to come out of a hole or they're barely hanging on and falling underneath. Not your job to sit there and say, hey, can you imagine what that's like? Let's, let's, let's stop all that and just, just, let's think about that for a second. I'm falling and I'm getting in a hole, and I'm grabbing mud, and, and I'm grabbing roots and vines, and all of it's breaking, and you're walking by. And you say, please, can you give me a hand up, brother? I need some help, sister. Please, and you stick your hand up, and they tell you, hold on, I prayed about this, and God said, i got to let you fall in that hole. That doesn't make any logical sense. Does that sound like a God of love to you? Does that sound like a God that looks after his children? No, that sounds like a God of someone's belly. That sounds like a God that someone has made up some junk and they want to stick to it. They just want to stick to it. And you know what? God will handle that. Because I guarantee you this, when that person moves on down the line, they got a hole waiting on them. Don't worry about that. But the next person may be the one in that hole with you holding your feet up. It may be the one that's right next to you that does have a firm hold on a root and says, hey, man, grab my hand. I got you. Sometimes we're looking for that person that is, that, that, that is well and good and safe, and God's testing their faith too, and they fail. But that one that's halfway out that hole may be the one that gets you completely out of that hole, completely. He may be the one that is able, or she may be the one, that may be able to put you on their back and climb up on that roof and get you out. It's interesting how the Holy, the Holy Spirit can, can really grab a hold of a, a sermon. You know, I, I had a sermon prepared that we were going to talk about the snares. But this was more vital. This is what's so crucial and good about understanding when the Holy Spirit directs you and guides you. He knows what needs to be talked about. He knows what needs to be spoken about. He knows what needs to happen. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to hear you, even in my state of where I'm sitting. And I thought it was important that you see me to know that I have faltered in some blessings. I have fallen into feeling bad about my situation with family health and my health and my finances falling through, job falling through, you know, all manner of, of stuff. And I allowed the devil to rob me of my voice. I allowed that. I allowed sin to overtake me so much, I felt like I was taking in water and drowning. And by the grace of God and the mercy of God and the brothers and sisters that have reached into the hole with me, that was in the hole with me, pulled me out. And here I am still struggling. I'm on the backs of some folks trying to get out. On the backs of them trying to get out. And they're taking my family with me to help us get out of that hole. We're not out yet, but we see some daylight. Those are the Christian brothers that are in, with you in the war. Those are the brothers and sisters that are true in Christ that are walking in him, walking in his faith, walking in his strength, relying on his strength, his mercy, to guide them in their actions. Jesus Christ told Paul, we got many people, I got, I got, I got people in this city, don't you worry about it. God has people in your life that has been in that hole with you, may be in that hole with you, but they see daylight, and other than looking selfishly on their own needs, they looked back, and they saw you in need, and they heard, 
and they heard with both ears God's merciful call, help my brother, help my sister, and they leaned back without regard. They have a firm hold because God has strengthened that arm, and they can reach back in and help. I love you, brothers and sisters. Thank you for praying for me, and I'm praying for you, too. I'm praying for you, too, all those listeners today. Let's go ahead and, and bow our heads and close our eyes, and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this sermon. Thank you for, for uh, my voice, Lord. Thank you for giving me strength and confidence to, to speak about what has hurt me and what has hurt many Christians. Thank you for those who are holding on to that root of faith, Lord, that has reached back into the hole in the darkness to, to help us pull each other out. We are so, so close to each other when we are so much inside the war zone, Lord, and we stay in a war zone as Christians. So let us continue to have faith, to keep reaching back, loving you, being able to hear your voice, and, and when you tell us to have mercy on others, Lord. Lord, bless us as we continue to, to struggle and in, in, in looking for light and air, Lord, but we're just so thankful that you have a comforter that you've given us in the Holy Spirit to help us. And someone listening today, Lord, that is going through problems and all kinds of manner of storm, Lord, let them know that, that, that no matter how much they get wet, no matter how much the rain has saturated their clothes, that they can get some shield and shelter from us, me, my brothers and sisters, anybody out there. There are people around them that can help them, Lord. Give them the eyes to see and ears to hear, and give them a voice to ask for that help, Lord. Let us be a service to someone who is in need, Lord. I love you so much what you've done for me, Lord. I love all of my brothers and sisters. I hope this message touches them and they reach out to me or someone nearby them that they may not think could understand their situation, a friend they might have overlooked, a person that they've not understood while they're in their life. Let them reach back to them and reach out to them and ask for assistance. And let them be comforted by that person, Lord. Let them hear and see your face. In Jesus' precious name, I love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all. If anybody has been in the fight, my hand is with you right now. I'm with you. Hang in there. Love you very much. And continue to help pray for me too. We all struggling right now in this in this this world, in this country. We all struggling. But it's better to struggle together than struggle alone. In Jesus precious name. I love you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.